Good morning to each of you, and uh, I would say a very happy Easter to you. Uh, let's become Lutherans. You know, the Lutherans always say, He is risen. What happens? He is risen. Hey, okay, let's be Lutherans just for a moment, and then we'll forget about that, okay? <laughs> but let's be Lutherans and say, He is risen. He is risen indeed. One more time. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And that's what brings us together today. We serve a living Savior. And because He's alive, that's our hope for life, not only here with meaning and purpose on the earth, but forever with Him in His place called heaven. So we rejoice in that today. We have another reason to rejoice today, okay? It's our birthday, all right, as a church. Eight years ago today, we began on Easter Sunday, and uh, since then, God has blessed and brought so many people to know Christ and done so many good things in lives. And we just rejoice in that this morning. So thank God for eight good years. Thank God for a risen Savior. Lots to be thankful for today. I would imagine that our God was having a lot of fun one day when he decided in his almighty mind to create the heavens and the earth. I can almost see him kind of pitching stuff out, you know. I don't know how he did it all. But I am certain he had a ball because he was creating the world and everything that was in it except for people. And that was his greatest joy when he could create what is called a dom. A dom means, uh, it, it, it means male and female. It means all of us together. And so God created us, humankind, Adam, male and female. And we were created in his image. And that means we had a lot of his characteristics about us. Let me share some of them with you. He created us to be incurably relational. He wanted us to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then to love each other and give our lives away to each other on a regular basis. He created us with astonishing abilities, abilities to bless him with our lives, to bless each other, and to bless this earth that he had created. And God also created us to be spiritual beings. And because he created us in his image, with his very spirit in us, his, his, his life in us as human beings, because of that, there is this God-shaped vacuum that's been in the heart and life of every person who's ever lived on this earth. And that's the reason, as I've said many times before, that everywhere you go throughout all of the history of humankind, there has always been religion. Because religion is man's attempts to try to know and please God. Whoever he may be to them, whatever he may be to them, that's their attempt and God wanted us to know him and love him and serve him. And so he created us as spiritual beings. Now, what I have shared with you so far is what I choose, and I don't even know if it's theologically correct or not, but I call it God's plan A. Because I believe that's what he wanted. He created us for that. And he wanted us to love him and serve him and love each other and serve each other. What a plan that was. And I say, yay, God, for that plan. But then something terrible happened. We decided that we knew better than God. We decided to say this to our Creator. Theologians call it the fall. Here's what we chose to say to our Creator. You know what? God, whoever you are, we see your plan, but we think we have a better plan. We don't like the fact that you have control over our lives because we don't think you can run our lives as well as we can. That very statement started with Adam and Eve in the garden, and it passes right down to all of us because all of us now, because they sinned against God and were representing to us, that's passed down upon all of us. And the Bible says, for all of us have sinned, and we've fallen short of the glory of God. So what we really did was, we ditched, as human beings, we ditched God for self-governance. And we were saying, I want to rule my own life. Now, I want to show you this morning, through a very strong testimony of Tom Porter. He and his family have experienced this. 
part of our church. And Tom has experienced in his life, as so many of us have, what happens when we want to say, I'm going to rule, I'm going to lead, instead of you, God. Watch Tom Porter's story. Hi, my name is Tom Porter. My parents divorced when I was in third or fourth grade. Um, so I moved in with my mom, my grandma, my grandpa, four uncles, two cousins, and my little sister. Um, things were good. We, we always had food to eat and always had camaraderie. And However, we were always um, surrounded by people, we always had stuff in our business, not really much freedom. So I uh, decided to move in with my dad on the south side where it was just me and him, and I kind of got to do whatever I wanted. Um, he had a list of bars that he could potentially be at when he would be off work, because back then there was no cell phones. If I needed him for food or whatever, I'd start at the top of the list and work my way down. Most of the times I didn't really need him for much, but uh, I learned at an early age to take care of myself. I was about uh, 11, 12, 13 that that was going on. Two doors down from my dad's house uh, was uh, a younger boy and an older boy that moved in and I kind of slid right in the middle and we began to hang out all the time. They went to church on uh, Wednesdays for youth group. His mom sang in the choir. So we'd go Sunday morning to the three services that they had and then we'd go in the evening for the one service. and. We did uh, youth groups and uh, summer camps. And um, I always felt the Lord wanted me to come down to the altar and accept him into my life. But back then it was just kind of nerve wracking to get up in front of a bunch of adults and walk down to the front of the altar. Later on that summer, we went to a, a concert, a Lowell Lundstrom concert at the fairgrounds. And for some reason, that was the day that I decided that I was gonna get up and I didn't care who all saw me go down, but I went down on my own and, and uh, some people prayed with me and handed me a Bible and some information. And um, I felt the Lord enter my life that day. I stayed pretty committed for that summer until the following summer that I was going into eighth grade, started experimenting with marijuana. Um, my mom's side of the family allowed me to be around that. So fast forward a few years, um, after I completely kind of fell away from the church scene, um, I moved in with a friend that uh, had an, an uncle. It wasn't really his uncle, but uh, my grandma at the time had a heart attack, so my mom couldn't get me to school, which is why I moved in with this guy, because I could walk to school. This guy asked me and my buddy what our dream cars were, and uh, we told him, and, and he dropped some marijuana on the table and said, go sell it to your friends at school, and before you know it, I'll buy you those cars. So that's exactly what we did. And we went and sold it to everyone we knew and brought them the money back. And it was a cycle for a little while. That was a bad deal. We uh, moved on. That guy got sentenced to 30 years in prison. My buddy I lived with, his mom committed suicide over this deal. And he was put in juvenile hall for two years. So I moved in with my girlfriend, moved back in my dad's house. That was the life. Everyone I knew partied, adults around me partied, drinking. So at my young age, I thought that's what uh, you do. I had started getting tired of the partying life and I had always been praying to God that he would bless me with this blonde haired, beautiful blue eyed girl who loved to work out and loved him and one day I was out riding my motorcycle and she happened to pull up right next to me and ask for a ride and everything kind of clicked one thing after another everything was just falling right into place and she loved the Lord and got me to quit smoking weed and 
pointed me in the right direction. So I thought and felt that that was the Lord talking to me, giving me direction, and things didn't work out. Almost exactly a year later, we broke up. I remember telling me that she wanted somebody like her dad that was Christ-oriented and family-oriented, and I remember it just crushing me. And I remember showing up at the bar and all my buddies uh, saying, oh, just have this drink, it's gonna be okay, it'll be fine, and I'll never forget that voice saying, if you take this shot, it's gonna be a long, bumpy road back to this life. And I took it, and down the hatch it went, and, and that is exactly what happened. I uh, fell down a rabbit hole of uh, anger. I was very angry with the Lord. I, th I thought, how could this possibly be a situation where both of our hearts are for you? And, and I thought that everything was supposed to be perfect if we had you in our lives, and it's not. So I was very, very angry with the Lord. So after all kinds of drug use, I will completely walk almost compl off the cliff and fall, free fall, um, if I don't have the Lord in my life. I've known Tom for eight years, and uh, I've watched God working to try to get control of his life, and it's been kind of fun. I always like to watch God work in people's lives, no matter the struggles they have, because I know, Tom, what uh, God wants to do with your life, and uh, he's at work, and we'll hear more of that story in a moment, but that kind of testimony should break our hearts, because uh, Tom... I wish to God hadn't have had to work through that. But that's that result of what has cursed us as human beings. We want to go off on our own way, and we want to do our own thing, and we get frustrated with God and with people and with ourselves, and then we go off and do more of our own thing, and we're struggling to try to figure out, you know, how does this life get under control? I want you to know while it breaks our heart, it breaks God's heart. Um, I kind of call it the ego syn syndrome. Now watch what we mean by that. E-G-O syndrome, the edging God out. And if we are careful, even as believers, we can edge God out of our lives. Take over kind of self-governance. I'll do it my way, my thing, my time. Then get ready for the results of that kind of syndrome when you edge God out. Let me show you a principle. Anytime God and His way is edged out of a home, a workplace, a church, or a nation, all you have left is human wisdom and human plans, and a lot of people get hurt. So you look at our society today. Look at our culture and see the families and the struggles they're having and the divorce rate and people hurting each other left and right and marital problems. You look at the physical and substance abuse that's just going on rampant in our society. And it seems like we just allow more and more of that to happen in our nation. Look at all of the angry children that fill our nation today because of however they were raised or even wrong decisions they've made in self-governance. And you look at the angry children uh, being violent with people and, and shooting people and killing each other. You look at the insecurity in relationships because it's very hard to trust anyone today because we've been wronged so many times by so many people. Individuals are distressed and discouraged and depressed and so many are in counseling today because they can't figure out how do I live this life. And You, you look at the family unit. It's really in trouble. I mean, it's very hard today in our society to even figure out what family is or what marriage is. And now we're even struggling to, find, to try to figure out what is a male or what is a female. And the more that we go down in that cycle of self-governance 
edging God out, which we've been doing for the last 50, 60 years in our nation, just kind of edge him out. We don't need this in God we trust. Edge him out. And then you look at the consequences. Look at all of the litigation and all the lack of ethics that you see in business today. Look at the church, a place that's supposed to be a place of safety and of truth and of love and of acceptance. And yet you see the, the church edging out more people than it's even wanting to include. Unacceptable before God. It breaks his heart. It should break our hearts also. Friends, self-governance is not serving our society or you or me well. It's not working. I think increasingly we're understanding it, but so many aren't willing to look to God. They want to just keep edging him out and I'll go to this or I'll go to this or I'll go to this to find my purpose and meaning in life. And you won't do it. Because we're created in the image of God to know Him and love Him and serve Him and give our lives to Him. And that's where we find our purpose and our meaning and our direction for life. So it's right here. And you got to know, even before God ever created the world, He had this plan in place because He knew ahead of time what we were going to do. He still had a plan A because this is what I want for you. But right at this point, God revealed his plan, and and I don't know if it's theologically correct, but I call it plan B. I call it the restoration plan. Because right here, God said, I'm going to send my son. He's going to be an example. He's going to be a teacher. I'm going to send him down to the planet Earth, and he's going to walk around in flesh. And he's going to represent me to the culture. And he's going to show my creation how to live their lives. If you look at Jesus, you'll see how to live your life. Because he's the way, the truth, and the life. And this example and this teacher, God said, will be able to atone for the sinfulness of the world. The word atone means pay the penalty Four. You see, the minute Adam and Eve sinned, there came a penalty upon them. It was the penalty of death, which means you're going to die physically, Adam and Eve, but you're also dead to me because there's a barrier of sin that separates you from me. And that barrier passed down to all of us, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And God said, there's no way you can pay for your sin. And you see, what religion is, and why I personally don't like religion, is because it's always, what can I do to make God happy with me? And that will never work. The Bible says that's just like a pile of the most filthy rags you could ever find piled up together. He says it's unacceptable. It's only good to be burned and gotten rid of and walked away from. Your works do nothing for you, he said. But I'm going to send this example and this teacher, and he's going to atone for your sin. He's going to pay. the You can't pay your penalty. No way. No good works. Not enough. But he can pay the penalty because he's the perfect son of God. The Bible calls him the perfect lamb of God for the sacrifice. And it's only through his perfect life, perfect birth, perfect life, perfect death, burial, and then perfect resurrection that we can have a hope for atonement. So here's the plan that God devised. It's ingenious. It's it's something only God could come up with because God should have said when we sinned against him, be separated from me. But he said, no, 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 no. He said, I'm going to ask my son Jesus Christ to trade spaces. (laughs) To trade spaces with these people. In other words, he's going to take my place. I deserve to be on that cross, but he traded spaces with me. And he said, I have, uh, he said, he will be the example, the teacher, and the one who can 
pay for the sin of the world. What a plan. <laughs> what a God. And so that morning, when Jesus burst forth from the grave, that morning he proved some things. He proved that he was God's son, the one who can and did atone, pay the penalty for the sinfulness of all of us. And he now has resurrection power to meet the needs of hopeless situations in people's lives. He now has the power to take hold of people's lives like yours and mine and Tom's and his family and start working his miracles in their lives. He works in families. He works in marketplaces. He works in churches. And he works in our world's nations. So what has Jesus been doing since he went back to be with his father after his resurrection? He's been working in individual broken lives. And with his hands outstretched to this world, what he's saying is the penalty's all paid. With his hands outstretched, this is what he says. I atoned. I traded spaces with you on the cross. I paid the penalty for your sinfulness. Now, will you take my hand? My hand's outstretched to you. Come, he says. Come. Will you take my hand? Put your faith and your trust in me. And your sins will be forgiven. Because he paid for them. It's done Religion says, do, do this, 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 this. Jesus says, no, 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 no. It's all done. Believe in me. Put your trust in me. And your sins will be forgiven. And I praise God that hundreds of millions of people have reached out to his outstretched hands. And they believed in him and received his forgiveness and salvation. Many of them have done that right here in this ministry the last eight years. And one of them is Tom Porter and his family. So let's hear the rest of his story. So I started praying again and asking God to help me get out of the addiction that I was in. And so I said, can I get a brunette with anything but blue eyes? Shortly after that, I met Casey, who's my current wife, who we have uh, three kids with. Life has kind of been great. She. Uh, Helped me get through a lot of those situations. She helped me uh, grow my business. Um, my very good buddy, Eric Saren, he introduced me to Simple Church. So we showed up for the first Easter event eight years ago. And we have not turned back since. Try to stay focused and uh, allow the Lord to lead us and guide us and teach our kids the values of uh, Christ and the importance of having the Lord in your life. Because I just don't know where I would be if I did not have that seed planted at such an early age. I got off track a little bit. I stumbled, I fell, drunken moments that I'm not proud of. And uh, those were eye-opening experiences for me to stay focused on the Lord. I've always had this voice in the back of my head kind of guiding me from right and wrong. And, and, and every time I would start walking up to the line and get ready to cross it, the Lord would kind of uh, pull me back and not really let me cross too far over the line um, all throughout my life. In every single decision I've made, the Lord has been there to help guide and shape those decisions. Some good, some bad, and you know, the Lord will definitely let you go and do as much of what you want to do until you're ready to surrender 
and uh, it's just how long are you going to deal with uh, your emotions in your head and um, decide to let the Lord do His work. I can't thank the Lord enough for protecting me from myself, even in the darkest of times. This is a story of God's grace, God's mercy, um, and His protection of your life, and He wants the same thing for you. He wants the same thing for you. Tom, I'm so thankful for those people who years ago uh, planted some seeds in your life. And uh, all through your life, God's never left you nor forsaken you. And uh, you've done a little self-governance. All of us have. But God's still bearing fruit through that. Praise his name for that. You see, that's what Palm Sunday and Good Friday and Easter Sunday are all about. It's all about um, the message that God loves you enough to send Jesus to trade spaces with you, to atone and set you and me free from our sin. That's the message that Christ has for this world today and every day because every day is resurrection day because he's alive forevermore. So I encourage you today, we can't make you do anything. This church really tries never to make anyone do anything spiritually because if we do, it turns into religion. What we want is for God to work in your life. And if God is speaking to your heart today and, and down deep in your heart, you know, I really have never reached out to those hands of Christ. I've never really let him come into my heart and life and, and said, I'm now done with self-governance and I'm done with my will and way and I want yours. Here's what the Lord is wanting to hear from you today. Thank you, Jesus, for paying the penalty for my sinfulness and for making possible the way for me to receive your forgiveness for my sin. I'm truly sorry for disobeying you, and I confess it to you. Please, forgive me. I will take your hand today, and I will ask you to lead my life from this day forward. I pledge myself to you, to your ways, and to your Spirit's direction. Help me be the person you created me to be. And I thank you, Jesus, and I love you. Amen. That is the kind of prayer. You can make it a lot more simple than that. All it is is a cry from your heart. Oh, God, I am a sinner, and I need forgiveness, and I believe in Christ, your Son, that he's my only hope, and I ask him to come into my life because he paid the penalty for my sin. He atoned for my sin. Praise our resurrected Lord for his message to us today. Because I live, you too. Because I traded spaces with you, you too can live. Father, our hearts are so humbled as we think of how much you loved us. How kind and gracious you've been with us all through our lives. You've never left us. You've never forsaken us. You've, you've kept trying and trying and working and working and knocking and knocking on the door of our life to say, I want to come in and I want to forgive you and I want to make your life so full of purpose and direction. Bless you. And then I want you to be with me forever in heaven. Oh God, I pray that you will help us to be people today who love you so much that we say, Christ, live in my heart. Take control of my life. Thank you for trading spaces with me. And thank you for changing the graves that I almost built in my life into gardens of beauty 
that you have planned for all who believe in you. We thank you you're alive, Christ, and we love you in Jesus' name.